It's Roz Stendhal, and it's Friday, March 29th, 2024, at 2.57 p.m. I'm going to do a video about gessoing paper for Frank, because he asked me a question about it in the webinar, for my Patreon. The question is really, when you have paper that's not suitable for wet media, how do you proceed and use that? in an effective way. And I have shown on Patreon where I gesso paper and then I paint in watercolor or in gouache on top of that gessoed surface. And so how involved is it? And uh, is it a, a easy thing to do? Is it labor intensive? What's the deal? Now, the joke is that I wrote Frank a 50 item response which explain the whole process. And I am thorough in my responses, but I want to be quicker today and give you an overview and let you know it does not have to be a strenuous process. It depends on what your goal is, what kind of surface you're working towards, what kind of surface you want to work on. Now, if you are going to be doing a surface that you're going to paint on and hang in a frame, you may want to have a certain smoothness to that surface. And that's where more steps come in, and I'll address those in a moment. But there is a point where you don't need to be that exacting in your application. What are you going to need to do this? First of all, you're going to need some gesso, some white gesso. You can use colored gessos if you want, but I always prefer to start with one layer of white gesso if I'm going to be ending with a colored gesso. It's just me. I, I like the way it works out. But any quality gesso is okay. This is bright white acrylic primer gesso from Golden. I like Golden because it smells the least to me, you're going to have to try out for yourself which ones have odors that you can tolerate. And I don't know that they make something called open gesso, but if any company uses the words open, it means that it's going to stay open longer. And I can't see that there would be a reason to do that in gesso. But just be warned, things that have open in them or you know, stay wet longer, whatever, um, those are going to have usually ammonia in them, and those are going to be very high odor. But this isn't like this. This is just plain ordinary uh, gesso. And if you don't have an odor problem of uh, sensitivity, then you can use a big bucket of the cheapest gesso that you can find. So, um, you know, compare prices and see what's what. You are also going to need some tools. If you want a smooth application, such as you might want on a board or a piece of paper that you're going to do a finely detailed portrait or something like that, you might want to get a foam roller. Foam rollers are going to yield the smoothest application with the least amount of sanding if you choose to sand. So this is a good thing that you can use and you can buy these inexpensively. I get them by like 20 at a time at um, uh, e nasco n-a-s-c-o dot com which is a online site for uh, artists and teachers basically to to buy sort of class packs and i can get these very inexpensively and i use this brush for my book binding for um, putting glue pva glue on big pieces of cloth and decorative paper while binding a book. So this can also be used for gesso. So um, I recommend that if you want the smoothest surface possible. I don't. I do this technique so that I can have texture. So this is out for me. You can slather it on with some sort of silicone tool. And um, this is a Catalyst brush from Princeton. They come in all different sizes and shapes. This is a color shaper, a one and a half inch firm flat. You can also 
move the gesso around with this. I'll, I'll use these two in a, in a bit to show you. This is a squeegee. Uh, any company will make these, and this one isn't better than others. Uh, it's obviously uh, useful for doing some gel printing uh, stuff and making uh, those extra kinds of, of striped textures. It's got different, this is a very soft lip and these are hard edges, so you can play with that. This is just your standard uh, run-of-the-mill burnisher, so you, you can use this to smooth things out but still have some ridges if that's important to you. You can use a natural sponge or you can use a manufactured sponge for that matter, but the natural sponge, one like this, will give you a very unique and non-repetitive surface, especially if you keep twisting the, the, the way that you push it down and, and where you push it down. Um, you'll get a very unique and interesting pattern and lots of little sort of pockets of depressions of gesso where you can put color when you paint. I tend to save these brushes for my watercolor for making texture and watercolor so I don't want to get gesso and stuff in them but you can have uh, certainly a dedicated sponge for that or multi-use and not worry about just clean them really well but um, I, I tend not to use them for this I just wanted to point out that it is an option. My preferred tool is the good old-fashioned uh, house painting brush. That's what this is. A couple of bucks at the hardware store. And I use this, you can see here I used it for um, a colored ground uh, sometime in the past and it didn't get all colored, uh, cleaned off. And there's some gesso that still hasn't come out of that, but um, you can see it because the brushes are black. Uh, you want to use a brush that doesn't shed bristles. So I would recommend that when you buy a brush that you check it out with water on some kind of, you know, uh, you know, waste paper surface or a piece of plexiglass and stroke it several times when it's wet to see that brush uh, hairs are not falling out because there's nothing more irritating than to be gessoing along and having bristles fall out onto your page. But using an inexpensive brush is great. I would not recommend you use your wide, uh, short haired, and usually pretty expensive quality Japanese uh, brushes. And um, you know, th those would, would uh, be, you know, probably ruined in this process over time. And you wanna save those for the lovely qualities they have for your painting. You're also going to need a tub of water, a little container of water. I use recycled uh, yogurt containers. It's been through the dishwasher. It's totally clean. It is not a uh, container that I've used for my watercolor paints or other kinds of paints. So it has no paint colors around the rim. I don't want to contaminate things. I always uh, decant some of the gesso. I don't ever stick a tool in my bottle of product. And the reason I don't do that is because any of these tools, no matter how hard you clean them, could have stuff on them that when you stick it in here, it's going to contaminate the product. Also, just leaving it open and, and dipping in it and working, even if only for a brief time, can cause a skin to form inside and that'll get sort of stirred around and reabsorbed and I don't like the way that over time that can make your materials uh, underperform. So I decant some and you need something to decant it on. I have usually a big uh, plasticized paper plate and I use that and that means I can then roll back and forth with a roller on the bigger plate and I can do other things on the bigger plate, but in this small space for filming, I can't use that, so I've just used the top of my yogurt container, and that'll be fine for what I'm gonna do. You can also put it in a little container like this, which is made to create large amounts of watercolor or acrylic paint wash. And this does have some color on it, so from, from past things that have sort of stained it, and it may pick up some of that color, so I wouldn't recommend 
Uh, you use it if you want a bright white gesso, but I'm going to show you how to color gesso, so that's okay for that. Okay, look. The kind of paper you want to do this on is paper that you want to paint on because you've got it and it isn't watercolor paper but it's maybe a heavier weight paper and maybe somebody gave it to you and you know there's 10,000 reasons why you'd want to color watercolor and paper. I'm going to use this for some of my things. This is a printmaking paper that's gray. It's a folio which is from uh, Legion paper. It's a lovely printmaking paper and I actually paint on this paper without gesso so you don't need to do that but I wanted a toned paper so you could see the gesso going on so we're gonna set that aside for right now. These are from some kind of notebook bound and it had uh, a perforated edge and I don't know what kind of paper this is. It's it's inexpensive. I can tell by the touch. It's got no texture on the back. It's got a cold press texture here. Um, you know, so you could use that for this if you worked on it and found that it wasn't okay. For the watercolor painting you want to do on that paper. This whole discussion started because I was telling people you can just take book binders aboard and you can gesso it. That's what this is. I uh, can tell I was using it for book binding because you can see my thin pencil grain lines that I've, I've written on the, the surface before I've cut it up into bits. But these are just the leftover scraps. And uh, I don't um, generally put many layers on them. I'm going to turn the light on here and see if we can get more. No, we can't. I'm, I'm having trouble with my overhead lights, but I think you can see from the edge there. Let's zoom in. There, you can see the strokes there. So you can see how they're strokes here. That's from this brush. Okay. And it leaves those strokes will create ridges in which the paint will pool. And I think that makes interesting texture. The point about having the gesso is obviously you can't paint easily on binder's board because binder's board is not sized for that. It doesn't have anything in it that will repel and hold the watercolor and uh, water on the surface. And so you just end up with a soggy mess unless you're like really careful and have really saturated dry pigments that you're using. But the other reason that you would want to do this is to isolate the board from the painting in the sense that if there is anything in the board, say you don't have an archival binders board, the gesso is going to keep the uh, materials from the binders board from, from uh, migrating into the painting. Um, then you'd want to do more than one uh, uh, coating. I don't have a sanding block here. I looked all around for mine and it doesn't seem to have survived the move. But a sanding block is a tool that's about yay, yay big, and the bottom is flat, and then you put a strip of sanding paper along the bottom and curve it up and stick it into each end of the sanding block. And then you hold on to the top of the sanding block, and you can do this kind of motion or that kind of motion all over the thing that you want sanded. Sanding blocks are useful for a number of purposes, and this is obviously one of them but you can also just use a piece of sandpaper but what I found is you tend to put the um, pressure on in different areas and you get an uneven sanding. So think about that when you're doing uh, sanding. If you do want a totally smooth surface I recommend that you put one layer of gesso on the surface let it completely dry. Set it aside and let it completely dry, um, probably 30 minutes depending on the temperature and humidity in your house. Really let it be solidly dry. Then make, so say we put them in this direction, then when it's totally dry, sand it with the sanding block. Wipe it off with one of those uh, wax impregnated cheesecloths which are used uh, for woodworking and other things like that. Just wipe that stuff off so you don't have little bits of grit there. 
and then gesso in the opposite direction, 90 degrees in the opposite direction, and let that dry. When that's dry, you want to go back in and sand it, and you want to clean it with the cheesecloth, and uh, you want to then, and I'm not sure if it's called cheesecloth, but it's that wax impregnated uh, craft cloth for uh, you know picking up dust. Um, but it's, it's very thin like cheesecloth. And then uh, you want to, after cleaning it, you want to put one more layer, which would be back in the original uh, vertical if you started this way. And then the second one was this way. And you want to go this way again. At that time, you can sand or leave the ridges on the way you want. You sand the earlier um, levels because you want to create a final texture later. And you also want to have greater adherence. And you're thinking of making a really nice barrier between your, your board, your wooden board or whatever, uh, your book board and your canvas. So that's the complicated explanation that originally I gave to Frank only with massive amount of detail at each of those levels, which obviously I've just explained it and you've all understood it, so we don't need to do that. But the simple version is if you just have a lot of paper, I bought some paper once I was at wet paint and they had just unpacked some paper and they had a box of 100 sheets of paper. They didn't know what it was and it had come from the manufacturer unlabeled with some other stuff they'd ordered. They'd called the manufacturer and the manufacturer said, we don't know what that is, just go ahead and sell it and don't worry about it. And I came in and I saw it and I thought, oh, nice big sheets. And I had a project where I needed um, sheets and they let me test uh, the um, brush pen on it. And I did and it worked and then I did my whole project with that. But that wasn't for painting. It was basically uh, some kind of separation sheet and it was not good for painting. But I went on to paint on it because what I did is I gessoed that paper. So that's certainly something that you can do. Um, I showed you this, I have one like this, I don't know, here, right in here you can see again the levels of the paintbrush. And I'll pop in some pieces that I painted on sheets like this so you can see, once color gets on it you can really see the strokes. I just wanted to show you some other surfaces. This is a board which I can't find anymore, I haven't looked for a while. But they're gesso panels. It says fine cotton, and what it is it's cotton paper, on already attached to a panel. And in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, but I think uh, you know early 90s also. I did a lot of my gouache paintings on boards like this. You can see here it's a bright white surface. This one hasn't been opened, um, and this is a paper. It's got sort of a cold press texture. So this would be uh, something that you can look for by some current manufacturer if you don't want to go through uh, these shenanigans of preparing your own surface. One of the other things you can do is to make the textures interesting, you can use stencils and I'll deal with that also. Now I wanted to show you this board and I'm going to come out a little bit so that you can see it better. Um, it's hard to explain how I got to the point of doing all of this but um, and this is just hard board like you would get at the um, hardware store and uh, a masonite type board and you can have them cut it to various sizes and they'll charge you per cut or something like that depending on your hardware store but uh, just go in with your idea of how many uh, pieces of each you want and so on. Um, so I took this and you need to seal this before you work on it as a final piece of art. And so I gessoed it and uh, on this side and did other gessoing. And then because of what I was doing at the time, um, I then put fabric on top of it, a uh, canvas, like you would paint on a regular canvas, but this was loose. It wasn't attached to anything. And it had a frayed edge and I allowed the various threads to come through because if you look at my paintings from the uh, from the 90s into the early 
uh, 2000s, my acrylic paintings, um, I had a lot of textures like this underneath my acrylic paintings. I find this an interesting kind of surface to work on. Now, what's a little bit different on this board is having done my three layers of regular gesso, as I've already described, uh, you know, one direction, dry, sand, clean with the cloth, uh, turn the direction, etc. Repeat three, three coats. Um, so I've got a perfectly small surface, but I've roughed that last surface up a little bit so it would have good adherence. And then I've glued with um, medium uh, the fabric that's on top. And then I waited it while the glue dried and however long that took. And then when that was done, I had these things sticking out on the edges. I folded them back in and then I gessoed it with um, absorbent ground. And absorbent ground is something that they make for people who want to work in watercolor on ground. And I don't like it. I like to work in watercolor, but I don't like absorbent ground. I think absorbent ground is too absorbent and it doesn't give me the effect I want. But for this particular thing, I did use it and I colorized it, um, you know, um, by using a um, acrylic paint on the top of it and then spritzing it to get, you know, these little patterns and stuff or disperse. But this is a little bit different, but another way to go. You might want to try absorbent ground. When F Frank went into the store in his town on the West Coast, and told him that he wanted to gesso some paper so he could watercolor on it, they sent him home with a jar of, of uh, absorbent ground. And then he wrote to me, that's what started all of this, and he wondered why he wasn't getting the kinds of results I was getting. And that's because I wasn't using absorbent ground. But you can use it, and you might prefer it. And you might even prefer adding extra things and texture and whatnot. And it's something you might want to do on that masonite board that you can get at the hardware store. Now, it's also nice and flat for going into a frame, so you can cut them, you know, a little bit smaller than 8x10 or whatever if you want to fit them in an 8x10 uh, frame easily. And you could, uh, if you were working in acrylics, you could then just coat the acrylic with some varnish and you could hang it without framing it at all if you wanted. But this would look a little, you'd have to do something to the edges. This just showed up in the move and I didn't want, having put so much effort into it, I didn't want to throw it away. So I will paint on this eventually. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece of unknown watercolor paper and we're just going to assume that it is, let's save that for something else, not suitable for what I want to do on it. And we're, there's a couple of things that you have to pay attention when you do this. And water management is one of those things. Let's come back out a little bit. It's a brand new bottle of That's the other thing you can use is a palette knife, and you can just slather the gesso on with your palette knife. So that's certainly something else you can do. I like that. This has a skin on the top of it. It should not have a skin on the top of it. So that's problematical. This is a clean palette knife, so I can stir it with that. I just got this today. Uh, I had to go to a store and get it because it's still very cold out. We just had a new dump of snow. And uh, you can't order this stuff in, um, in the mail because um, when it's uh, cold like that, because it'll freeze when it's being shipped in the airplane. So let's just, you know, you could just put it down here like this. And... You can just sort of spatula it on. Now there I am, I'm breaking my own rule and putting my tool back in there. I was so eager to get going. I'll just move this along here. For my purposes, I don't usually 
um, worry about the edges, except if I'm going to be framing something, I will stick it on a larger sheet of paper, waste paper, and I'll go right off the edge of it. Okay? So keep that in mind. You can ha have untreated areas at the edge of your paper, or you can... Put it on waste paper. And I'll just push that there. And then you do want to get this residue off the lip there because that is going to glue your lid shut. So I've got a clean paper towel here. And I'm just going to get that off there. Now, of course, I've got stuff all over my hands, so take a moment. I'll let this one dry so that you can see it. I'll scan it later, but you can see the ridges that it has on it. So the deal for me is that if I'm going to do this, I'm going to put newspaper or clean newsprint all over the floor, and I'm going to do like 10 sheets at one time all over the floor. And I can't videotape that way, so that's why you're not seeing it that way. I'm through with this now, I can put it away. And now we're ready to look at, uh, let's do one other sheet. This is that unknown paper and we're gonna take, this is a dry brush. We're gonna put it in the water and we're going to then squeeze all of the water out of the brush. What we want is for the hairs to be moist but we don't want a lot of water in the brush. Other people, I'm sure, have other ways they do this, and that's for them. This is for me. And I do want now, I do want this all the way over here. Okay, so now I've taken that damp but not wet brush, and I've dipped it in here, and I am putting it on here, going right off the edges, Now, if I were going to, see it's pretty even, there's some lines there, strokes in another direction. If I were going to do something where I wanted to be really smooth, I would then uh, wait for it to completely dry, sand it, dust that off with that wax impregnated pregnated cleaning cloth, and I would turn it and do it the other direction. But I don't want that. I'm just going to take, and it's curled because I'm talking, you might want to tape it down if you're using this lighter weight paper, but what I want to do is just put some bigger strokes that have more ridges, and you can do this with any tool that you want, that's with the brush, so they have these bigger strokes, okay? now. You could do it, like I said, with one of these tools. And then you could get back and get some really thick ridges. And maybe you already know what you're going to paint on this piece. So that would be helpful. And you could sort of put your ridges where they're going to work in your composition. Same thing would happen with the squeegees only you could do a bigger area. Okay, I'm going to use this now. And oh, this is still, you might need a little bit more water. The thing is you don't want to add a lot of water to the gesso, I don't feel. I want it to be I want it to be thick and I want it to be able to move. And as long as it's doing that, I don't need any excess water. And then it'll dry faster. And the big plus to not putting water in your brush is that if you work on 
of a binder's board which doesn't have sizing to repel the water or other paper that doesn't have sizing if you have a lot of water in your brush it right away seeps into the board and turns it into muck so this low water thing is key if you think of nothing else from this that's the most important takeaway you want almost absolutely no water in your brush so here is a normally I'd have another layer of um, a gesso already down but you can see it better if I do it with this this way and this would be the second layer and then I'd get this kind of and you can do this kind of thing with a stencil you can do this with um, modeling paste too in fact you'll get a more pronounced thing so you might want to do a layer of gesso without the stencil in place so the whole thing is covered with gesso and then you do the modeling paste when that's dry and has been sanded and cleaned off you do the modeling paste with the stencil and then you get these raised lumps of stuff I'm trying to get all those little bits of paper okay and then you'd want to take a, a smoothing tool like this and you'd want to take it over the top you want to clean that off if it's necessary to be cleaned okay now what's going to happen is you're going to have a pronounced texture that's slightly raised and that'll be fun for you. When you're doing this, you want to do the cleaning of the stencil as soon as possible. And I would not normally leave this brush like this, but I wanted to get that stencil clean. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do real quickly is we're going to take some fluid acrylic from Golden and we're going to take a little yellow iron oxide and a little uh, thalo blue green shade. I don't know the quality of these particular bottles of paint as a friend just sent them to me. Not using them anymore. Oh, hasn't even used them. Okay. Let's put a little squirt in there. And we're going to look at toning or tinting is the proper word that we use. Has this one been opened? So we're going to take a little brush, slide a little brush. That's a good one. I like, I like that kind of weird green color. Okay. And then we're going to take this. some more of it. I'm going to mix it. It's uh, too... That's not really what I wanted, but we'll see. Yeah, I hate it when just over when you're working on the floor um, you can really oh there I like that much better okay I would do this as the third layer if I was doing a painting on top of it to hang on the wall but as a journal piece or whatever you can do it as just a as a first layer I like to mix the the tint up so that you can get some of the uneven color 
showing as well as the texture. Pick up some of this white over there. There we go. That's kind of fun. This is paper color and I want that. Um, I'm just introducing that because I want to put some more texture to it. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, this has been in here. It's solid so it can sit there. This you don't want to leave sitting in there like this. I'm immediately going to get up and clean it. But there we go. We've got another one here that's ready to be painted uh, if I want. And that's how that works. So I've got it, of course, all over my pen, which I didn't want. You'll do it where you have more space and you can control the distance between things that might get on other things. But I think you've seen here that there's a lot of stuff that you can do and this will enable you to use those mystery papers. Sometimes what you might find is that something that you uh, gesso and sand is perfect for one of your favorite pen types. And that would be something, this brush just broke, um, that would be something that you could then uh, use and capitalize. Uh, so, um, you know, you, you go from having a, a paper where the ink bleeds through to having a paper that has a perfect surface for the way you like to use your brush pen, something like that. But I look at it mostly as taking uh, the ability to do wet media on a surface that doesn't normally allow it. Okay? So how are some ways that I use gesso? Here's an example of a sheet of paper that was not suitable for watercolor, and I gessoed on it, and then I did a direct brush painting with watercolor. That means I didn't do any drawing, I just went in with the brush and started putting color in. The great thing about this approach on gessoed paper with traditional gesso or with uh, acrylic gesso is that the watercolor is easily lifted. So you can go in with a wet brush and lift areas out. You can uh, mop places up, but you can also nudge your washes into areas. And so that's what I find is really fun. And it puddles in interesting ways, as you see when we scan through the painting. Uh, you can see the strokes of gesso that were the final coat of gesso and how it's causing the watercolor to puddle. Here's another direct brush watercolor painting on a gessoed surface. This gesso was applied to bookbinder's board. Here you can see a close-up of the detail and you can see the way that the strokes of gesso are pulling the pigment into pools contrary to where you might normally have those pools of pigment and also not necessarily in the direction of strokes that you might have made. So there's that counteraction that I like, which really emphasizes the texture. This next example is a little different. It's a very vertical piece. There's a square that you can see in the center area where there is masking tape. That was where I masked off an area and applied gesso only within the masking tape. This is one of my piecemeal portraits or piecemeal style portraits where I do things to either add other papers or other textures and use masking tape and gesso in what I find are fun and interesting ways. The application of the gesso within the rectangle allowed me to paint a rect brush on there and get interesting textures and not have the paint seep through the paper, which was not a watercolor paper. That leaves me with the problem of once I leave the masking tape area, how do I get a match between the two different surfaces? And that's a fun thing I like to play with. I also like to use uh, gesso and acrylic paint on binders board as already discussed, but not just to paint paintings, but to create covers for books. 
So it gives a different look than having decorative paper, and it's a fun element that you can play with. So that's something that you can do if you're very careful and you don't get a lot of water in your acrylic paint. You can go straight to acrylic without the uh, gesso, but I find that gessoing at least one coat first allows you to smooth the cut edges of the board and the surface and allow the ridges that you want, uh, but it also allows a brighter color application. You see the white of the gesso through any transparent or translucent portions of the acrylic and you don't see the brown binders board, but you can do it either way. I hope you have some fun with this. Thanks for following along. We'll talk to you later.